see what you would have seen your second year in the honors college. Yeah, so that was cool. Hello, I remembered to put stop play. Uh, I didn't actually watch the lecture, but I didn't read your email until after it was too late to answer your question. Um, but I remember the lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, but well, you, no, you don't have to answer a question. As long as, long as you're present at least one day, you don't have to. Okay. It's only if you're a fully remote person. Yeah, so you guys don't have to. Only if you're fully remote. Um, yeah. So see. Actually, like, Sophie and Nico are in that lecture. <laughs> oh, you could, that's right. You did see them, can't you? Yeah, and I sent a picture of it to Sophie. And she was like, I don't think that's me. I think that's Nico. And I was like, no, that's for real. You and oh like, my I gosh. Like, I'm not working. Like, I'm very funny. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I have a question about the Bible. Um, you know, you talked about how it's not really about the Bible. It's about the Bible. It's about the Bible. It's about as we try, I mean, do you, do you think, and if, are any of you following the numbers? Are they continuing to go down? Uh, no. COVID numbers? No, oh, dear. <laughs> Apparently they're getting a little better. The regional director said they're, they're supposedly going down. Oh, they are? Okay. But I also saw the news that Spain and France saw another spike. Oh, really? Gosh. We'll see, because then people could start coming again. I, where my kids are teaching, they were saying that the students had to, had to choose all or nothing. You were either on, on campus or off for nine weeks, and like you couldn't change your mind. Like here, you could change your mind. The Woodlands were doing that. Too. Are they doing that too? Yeah. So you got to make that decision. That's, that's a big decision. Wow. So anyway, we will continue on. We were talking about the difference between Eurozin and Orc. Remember, Eurozin represented uh, the the negative version, Blake's version of Jehovah, the God of the Thou shalt not, who represses, who crushes. Uh, and we saw that particularly in those poems, uh, the Garden of Love and London, uh, where again the, the the adult population crushes the child population and crushes all innocence and joy. And we said that Eurozone is so strong that the only thing that can defeat it is Orc. And actually, if you watch the video, it went a little past what we did today. Um, so we're going to look at. Uh, there's a poem called "The Tiger." On page 139, uh, one of his best-known poems. Uh, and can you guess what the tiger might be the contrary to? Lamb. The lamb. Okay, and very much is you know instead of having the same name like the chimney sweeper, it's the tiger of the lamb versus the tiger. And the tiger is going to embody the nature of orc, this orcic energy that is strong enough to shatter the chains of Eurasian. But I thought, um, uh, like I said, because we have a little more time than I usually do, go back to page 138 and look at the poem called The Sick Rose. Because I think it's worth talking about this, and I hope this will interest you. It's an English majory kind of thing. Right? And then we all learned this in like third grade. What is the difference between a simile and a metaphor? In a simile, what do we have? A simile is like or as. Good. An example. So my love is like a red, red rose. Right? Something is like something else. But what happens in a metaphor? as if it were exactly the example you're comparing it to. So instead of saying he was as tall as a tree, you'd say he was a tree. He was a tree, good. And, and, and it, it's different. There's, there's more of a, a magic, almost an incarnational magic. Uh, Since so some of you were in, um, uh, were in uh, uh, As You Like It, uh, when does uh, somebody start his speech with a wonderful metaphor for life? All the world's a stage and all the men and women, merely players. I can, do, do you have the whole thing memorized? Yeah. You weren't you weren't that, that character. Who played that character? Aria. It was Ari. Oh, I can see that somehow. Yep. <laughs> He's a funny one. It really was. It was so funny because she dresses like the dark academia aesthetic. Oh. She like had a coffee cup with her. And she just and kept like, all the world the stage sick. No. Did you have to wear a mask when you recited? Yeah. When you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I have a drinking problem that goes right down the mask. Anyway. So Again, the metaphor is more magical. Now, even stronger than a metaphor is a symbol. And in one sense, a symbol is a metaphor, X is Y. But when you're in the realm of a symbol, sometimes it's not too clear what the X or the Y is. Right? All the world's a stage. Right? Life is like a play. Life is like a theater. But in a symbol, we've got... Again, ultimately, it's a metaphor. right? But it's, it's somehow... It shimmers beyond that, like like uh, like in a Catholic mass where the bread and the wine are the body and blood of Christ, and not at the same time. I mean, that, they, I think you could more commonly call that a symbol. It's beyond a metaphor. 
<laughs> Maybe if you're a Baptist, it's more of a metaphor, right? But in a Catholic church, it's more of a symbol, right? And so some, some of you have heard me talk about it this way, that, that you know, there, there is more magic uh, in, in, in the Catholic understanding of the Mass. It's very, it's very symbolic. It's, 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 it's uh, uh, what do I call it? it it's, there's a trafficking between two worlds, right? So you go to Catholic Mass and you start with bread and wine, and during the Mass, it's mystically transformed the body and blood of Christ. But in my Baptist church, we also start with bread and wine, but the bread stays bread, and the wine is mystically transformed into grape juice. So it, there's not as much magic there. Really. Like, you know, so I, I want to kind of build up to this, because the tiger is one of the great symbols in sort of romantic poetry, that, 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 that sense of something that... We know that something is something. The man is the tree, but it, 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 it's, it's beyond us. It's, it, we can't quite put our finger. So here's just a, a warm-up because it's simpler, but not simpler in the sense that it, it's hard. To, it's still hard to understand, but it's shorter. And it says, O rose, thou art sick. The invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. Now, this to me is terrifying. Okay, This is taking place in a sort of scary world, just, just outside of touch. There seems to be something like a rape going on here, some kind of forbidden love. It certainly has a violence to it. It's obviously not about a, a rose and a worm. It, there's got to be something beyond that, right? But what, 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 what again, what, what kind of world are we catapulted into when we read this poem? How would you describe it? Probably not a world we want to visit. I used to play that game with my kids when we were young, and we'd watch a, a fantasy movie, and I would always say, should we go there for our summer vacation? And it would be, yes, and then it would be like dinosaurs tearing each other. No! So that was always the kind of ongoing joke. Should we go there for our holiday? Um, if I was wanting to sound British, I would say holiday. We say vacation. British say holiday. Um, but uh, so what? How can you describe this world? What is this place? Okay, I mean, ultimately, it's the world we see. It's, it's certainly about a loss of innocence in one sense. What what we don't know here is if it is a actual rape, or if the rose has somehow desired the dark secret love, but is still destroyed by it. And, and either way. The, the, the feminine principle, at least, seems to be destroyed here. But it's a world where innocence cannot be maintained. It is a, a dark world of, of forces that are beyond us. That, and, and again, you, you can't, I mean, you understand what the, world, what the poem's about. It's pretty clear, but at the same time, it seems to resonate with, with, with a, a deeper meaning. Uh, it certainly plays on our sense of fear and psychological dread. All of this is going to be even more true of the tiger. But we see it here in miniature, in this poem. Right? Be afraid. Be very afraid. Ah. Right? So. so now we're going to... Oh, so we, have, we haven't quite made it to eight. Then we would be more than half. Right? We're a little bit less than half. But that's pretty good. <laughs> okay, so let's look at the tiger now. I just wanted to kind of get this idea here... Um, Maybe you could say that the sick rose is about fatal curiosity, curiosity that destroys. Again, but you can't quite put your finger on it. Uh, now let's look at the tiger. And again, we know what it means, but it, it again, it, it's a doorway into a world that, that has a richer meaning, but a more terrifying meaning. So it begins, tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful Symmetry. Now, you can know that you are a true English major if you read this poem. And and what what does what does the title do to you when you read the title? I mean, if you felt just a little frisson when you saw a tiger spelled with a Y. Yes. Yeah. Annoying. I mean, you're annoyed. Okay, I mean, just just that idea. And then the British still spell it that way. Like like uh, I remember being in English and, and it was uh, used tires and it was called T Y R E, the, the tire. So I think. There's something cool. I mean, it's just. Oh, well, I guess maybe, yeah. But it's just like the tiger. Don't you want to say it that way? Tiger or something. It's just. It, it, just the, the strangeness. Now, of course, that's not going to mean anything to the British, but to, to us, it has a kind of a strangeness.
too late. Right? Yep. What are you thinking? Wait, say it again. Oh, oh, you're talking about the student? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, he's a cool guy. I'm going to be thinking about now. Oh, we'll have to make fun of him, yeah. He, 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 was, he was he visited my church yesterday. That was kind of neat. Yeah, he's cool. How did you meet him? Because he's a master's student, is he? Oh, okay. Oh, you did? Okay. Oh, yeah, he's a cool guy. I think he's still single. Oh, he does? Oh, okay. He's Oh, he's younger than you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, that's right. He's not that old for a, for a grad student. He's not that old, though. But anyway, he's, he's a cool guy. He was, was, what was it that he went before? No, it was the other guy that went to Rivendell. Seth, I think his name was. There's a, there was a school, I think they changed, but it was called Rivendell. that cool? What? Like, like, remember that guy, Connor, a tall guy with the fuzzy hair? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, they went to, I think they've changed the name of it since, but it used to be called, it used to be called, what is it? I said cowards, they should have left it at Rivendell. And they should have left it at Rivendell, because that was a great name, but anyway, really good. Yeah, Seth and Seth, those two guys. <laughs> okay, so, again, in the forests of the night. Well, I mean, a forest at night is a pretty scary place, but this is clearly something beyond that. Like, in other words, it's not just a forest at night. It's the forest of night. So I mean by it, it's, it's a symbol. It, it, it is itself. It is a real place, but it's a place that we only visit in, in a nightmare, maybe. A sense of dread. Oh, maybe that's true because he, he gets lost in the dark wood of error in the beginning. So it's possible he had that in mind. The dark wood of yeah, it's he, he does talk about it being scary. It's more more a sense of dread than ultimate fear, like a wild animal tearing at your throat or something. Yeah, he does meet the wild but he does, that's true. He does meet the three. Yeah, the lion, the she wolf, and the, and the what is it called? The, the and the and the leopard. Yeah, the leopard. Um, and he, he, he might have had that in mind. That's true. But again. Tiger burning bright. Of course, w- when I hear burning bright, I, I don't so much think of a, a tiger on fire as the eyes are burning bright. I think it's the way we see it. Piercing to the soul. Someone you can recognize with a mask on. <laughs> um, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy... F- now, how, in, in what way does fearful symmetry kind of an oxymoron? Good. We, 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 the word, we, would, we would link it to the word beauty more, right? And fearful, we would link more to the word sublime. So if you think of the sublime, the beautiful, it's a yoking of opposites. But in a sense, it's a thing of beauty. I, I, I would think of like a leopard or a lion that's, that's all tense and about to pounce on you, right, and d- devour you. But there's a beauty to that at that same moment. So, again, the yoking of the opposites is already getting at a strange force that lies beyond. It's neither sublime nor beautiful. It is, and as we'll say in a moment, we said it before, but it's beyond good and evil. Um, in what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? I see we were right. On what wings dare he aspire what the hand dare seize? The fire. What hand seized fire? Prometheus. Prometheus. Okay, we immediately bring up the idea of Prometheus, who unlocked a kind of energy. And in Greek mythology, the fire that he stole and gave to us, I mean, yes, it helps us to, you know, uh, keep away wild animals. It helps us to light our house. It helps us to cook our food. But fire is also the essence of creativity. And if you think about all the, the arts, like the original arts that a craftsman would do, what, what do you need fire to do, these sort of original arts and crafts? So you say? Glass blowing. Oh, good, glass blowing. Anything you do with glass usually calls for fire, right? What else calls for fire? Good, pottery. So you usually pottery needs a kiln at some point. Obviously, if you're a blacksmith, a lot of the arts call for fire in one way. And so it is often seen... As the, as the, 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 as the essence or origin of human creativity is, the, is in that fire. So it's not just practical in the sense of warming your home or whatever. Uh, and orc is the power. We said quickly before it is the power of revolution, but it's the power of creativity and inspiration as well. It is that that outbreaking, that uh, explosion of energy. And again, or Prometheus was a friend of man, but he was also a rebel. 
Prometheus is both a Christ figure because he suffered, but he's also a Satan figure because he went against Zeus. And, and in that sense, especially for Blake, Zeus would be linked to Jehovah, the Jehovah of Paradise Lost, as we said before. So, uh, and does anybody know what famous novel has a subtitle, The Modern Prometheus? Frankenstein. Frankenstein. That we'll be reading. Okay, we'll talk about that more. Uh, on what wings dare he aspire? Was there another, another Greek myth? Yeah, Daniel Nicholas. Very good. So we got the, the two were sort of. Is that what you mean? Icarus, yeah, the two of them. Right? Uh, again, this is, these are people that are going by using ingenuity, human ingenuity, we breathe these two, but using that to, to break limits and to shatter the limits that perhaps were put on us by Urizen or Zeus or Jupiter or Jehovah uh, from, from Blake's point of view. Uh, again, it, it's, it's, it, it, there's a, a sort of presumption here that shatters limits, but often leads to destruction, like Icarus falling to his death, or Prometheus being bound to the rock and having the eagle feed on his liver, or vulture sometimes. And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp. This is like something that's come out of a, of a crucible, right? Where you get the, the molten metal inside of the crucible. This makes me think of the birth of the Urukai. Who are the Urukai? Yeah. Where, where do we see that in the movie? If you've seen the movie, it's the first movie. What, 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 what has um, Saruman been doing? Guy, guy. Because he's been breeding man, orcs, different things. Out of, out of the fire, out of the fires of Orthanc. To create, the, the thing about the Urukai, the fighting Urukai, is that they're orcs that can do what? Yeah, can live in a day, go out in the sun. Oh, I see orcs in the sun, what's the world coming to? Right? So, but again, there's a sort of, I don't know, if you have Blake in my but there's a dark magic here. A use of technology and ingenuity to do something new, but should it have been done? In the first place, that's the question. We're, we're, we're breaking limits and we're breeding. And this is a movie, it's so grotesque. They're like pulling himself out of this like cocoon. And the first thing he does is what? Remember? He like destroys the guy that just yeah. birthed him, so to speak. It's stuck to me. Oh, what a wonderful child. Okay, yeah. Oh, you want to? Oh, there we go. Oh. Take it bit by bit. Sooner or later. <laughs> You have to binge watch it. You know you do. You had 12 hours. <laughs> Extended edition. We've done it many times. None of you have ever been to oh, one of our... Yeah, yeah. No, no, I mean to my house. I've done many, many, many a party over the years. So for, particularly New Year's Eve party. Oh. Bringing in the New Year's and you're just there. Sometimes it's like four in the morning when we get to the end. It's great stuff. Right time and you hit midnight right That's right, yep. There we go. Oh, man. Yeah. Woo! Good stuff. So... Again, there, there is, it, 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 it's like the tiger dwells in the place, again, where orc is born, where creativity, where it all comes out, like, like it's a volcano or something. We continue with this, we would call it apocalyptic imagery, like the end of the world. When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears. Now that's really cool. Just think of, how can you read that in two different ways? When the stars threw down their spears. There's two, two very different r reasons why you would throw down your spears. If you think about it. Good. Either surrender, I throw down my spears, like drop your weapons and put it up, but it could also mean I've thrown down my spears to attack you. And again, can you think of a book where you would have images like that when the stars threw down their spears? Last battle? Well, okay, the last battle, that's true. The, the stars literally come down. But what, what might he have had in mind before? Paradise Lost, okay? And uh, Lewis, Lewis did like Blake. And, and, uh, well, like I said, he wrote The, Mar uh, the Great Divorce Against the Marriage of Heaven and Hell. And uh, I love it, too, when he says, uh, I've, I've called my book The Great Divorce not because I claim to actually understand The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. <laughs> Fully understand. Um, sometimes I'll teach a class just on the romantic poetry, and then we'll do The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. But 
I haven't done that yet because we have to make sure we, the class fills, you know, right now. But we'll get there. You have to. Your job is to make more majors and minors. Go out there and get them. Oh, they, oh, really? Oh, good. They're coming up. Oh, and they're up and coming. About your class? I'm, I'm English people, yeah. I think I've met a lot of honors people who are biology. Oh, and yeah, no, that's... There's yeah, a yeah, lot of biology, nursing, engineering. Not just nursing and engineering, though. Like, half the class was biology. No, they really are. Mm-hmm. And you have to give Dr. You have to give Dr. Hart, Dr. Hartenberg a hard time, because all he ever wants to talk about is the pre-med and nursing people. It's like, you know, you're a philosophy... Get some humanity to make you know. Get some philosophy. Yeah. Well, again, see, we used everybody used to double major here, and it was very common to do biology English or business English. Very common. Like Spanish would be a second major. I would. I don't. Know, do you think students would would revolt if we said everybody has to major minor? I wonder if they would revolt. People like choice these, but I mean, it looks much better on your. Transcript, it should set you apart. I mean, I would think if I'm going to get a job in business, if I had an extra minor in writing or, or, or in English, it would just make me stick out, I would think. Or even if I'm going to med school, for that matter, I would think it would help you stick out, be a little different. Let's try. Say it again. The minors need to be like a mixture of fun. Yeah, no, that's true. Maybe. It's only six classes. That's true. I'd do it anyway. Now, you're, you're actually a Spanish, Spanish minor. minor. Okay. Are you doing that thing that they offer? They get this cool thing where if you're really, really good at Spanish, you can get out of like nine hours. Then you'll get them by, by testing out. But if you do that, you have to take at least like another class, whatever, or two more classes. So you end up with five classes. So just take another class and you've got a Spanish minor. So it was very smart the way they put it together. Maybe you thinking of doing that yourself? I am thinking about it. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's great. If you're good enough in Spanish, you'll get nine free hours, but you don't get them unless you do six more hours. And then they'll end up, you know, so you're, you know, that's like half a semester, a little more, uh, for free, basically. And you take more. So it's it, it, worth looking into it. That's your Or either that or Dr. Moreno will tell you more about it. But I, I thought it was pretty enterprising of them. Pretty enterprising. Anyway. Um, Okay, so, so again, we've got something, something strange, a war in heaven. And then it says, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? And the, he ultimately is God here. Now, what, 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 what question is being asked here? Did he who make the lamb make thee? Can you like put that in a more abstract sense? What is the question here? It, it also, thank you. It is ultimately the problem with what they call a theodicy. Where did evil come from? Could God have created both good and evil? How is that? I mean, ultimately, that is the big question here. What is the origin of evil? Right? But, as we've said, what's weird about this and why it's proto Nietzschean is that ultimately this tiger is neither good nor evil. It is just simply force and energy, and it is beyond good and evil. It depends how you channel it. And that's what I said at the end of the last class, is that the, 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 that Blake foresaw Nietzsche by almost 100 years because uh, in Eurasian we have what he called the slave ethic, where the, where the weak people use religion to chain the, the stronger people. And then Orc would be like the Ubermensch, the overman who rises beyond good and evil to exert his will to power. Somebody who has charisma, you, you use that word, the, 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 the ubermensch has charisma that allows him to knock everything down. That's what we've got here. We've got something that, that's beyond anything like that. It's not a simple good-evil uh, kind of dichotomy. So that's a big question. How, how, and, and, and just in terms of Blake, could the same God have created the world of innocence and the world of experience? Right? Both the lamb and the tiger. Is it possible that, uh, that you know, somebody could, could have done that? The uh, wild stuff. <laughs> the vault of it is, yeah. This use of free will. Right? And then, tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? Obviously, what can you tell me about that last answer? They change from good brain Good. Brain. It's exactly the same, but one change. So, what, what, what different question are we asking when we go from could frame to dare frame? We, we want to know not only who could have done it, but 
Should they? Would they? Why? I mean, I can understand. Okay, now I understand. Maybe there is a whatever power strong enough to create the tiger, but who would dare do it? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Why was why was it done? Ooh, I, I mean, I, it's just a wonderful thing. That's just who could do it, but who would do it? Why would they do it? Why is their experience? Why is their evil? All of these questions are sort of thrown up uh, uh, in that. But uh, great poem. But like I said, it, it, we know what it means, but it's also more tenuous. It's just not as easy to put your finger on like a metaphor is. Or you know, the other, other versions of metaphors are metonymies and synecdoches. You know that stuff? Where the part represents the whole, like, give us this day our daily bread. Are we only praying that God gives us bread? What are we praying for? Good. And all of our needs. In fact, not just food even, but what, what, what are usually the things? It's, it's food and what are the things? Clothing. clothing, shelter, usually the three we would put together as our basic needs. Now, if you move to California, you can leave out the clothing part. Uh, and you just... <laughs> even Austin. Even Austin. Oh, really? It's getting wild, okay? Oh, yeah. yeah. Hey, have they left for Colorado yet? Yeah, they left uh, Her, her, her uh, sister and brother-in-law have moved to Colorado. It's yeah. snowing there. I'm like, Winter starts at like the end of August. Such a beautiful place, Colorado. I guess I'd rather be. Wonderful. There was so there was the now, those are the main ones, but let's just look at a few others because they're fun and we have a little time here, so we won't, we won't go as deep. But just the next poem, or two poems down on page 140, Ah, Sunflower. I think this is one of the saddest, most melancholy poems called Ah, Sunflower. From experience. Ah, sunflower weary of time, who countest the steps of the sun, seeking after that sweet golden clime where the traveler's journey is done, where the youth pined away with desire and the pale virgin shrouded in snow arise from their graves and aspire where my sunflower wishes to go. It's just such a longing and a sadness there, a desire, a frustration, all caught. And, I mean, th th that phrase is poetic, but it's quite literal. Who countest the steps of the sun. What, what does that mean? I mean, it's almost quite literal. The sunflower turns to follow. Yeah, it turns, right, tracks the sun. And it, it tracks the sun just like a what? You say it again. You said a sundial. Yeah. It's like, like, I mean, of course, the sundial doesn't move, but, I mean... You know, a sundial works, but here it's like, I mean, it is weird. I mean, the, 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 it's so weird. How does it know to do that? It tracks the sun. It's just like those morning glories that actually open when the sun comes out. It's just magic, right? It's magic stuff. But here now, it's as if the sunflower is yearning after the sun, like a moth yearning for the flame, right? reaching on the moth that yearns for the moon or whatever that kind of thing, some of the stories, reaching out and reaching out. And what do these two have in common? The youth pined away with desire, the pale virgin shrouded in snow. Now, you know, one hopes that in a Christian poem, virginity would be a positive thing. How, how does it become more of a negative thing here? What does it mean here? She's dead. She's dead? Oh, she's dead? Okay, right. No, she's ultimate, right? The pale virgin. Oh, because she's pale, right? Shrouded in snow. And here, for... for, for for the soul, I mean, it's, 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 an, it's an expression of, of the repression of desire. Remember when we looked at the poem, The Garden of Love, and priests in black grounds were walking their rounds and binding with briars my joys and desires. Okay? By the way, I'm not telling you to act out this poem, please. Okay? Uh, but here is that sound of all, all shrouded and, and, and caught up, and, 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 and love is lost, and the youth is pining away, but... But without anything, I, I almost think of, in a weird way, I think of both Echo and Narcissus. Echo pining away with love for Narcissus, and Narcissus pining away with love for himself. Like, but both of them are. And that, that, that's, you know, have you, have, you ever, have you ever felt that way? We still use that expression, the girl pined away for the boy. We still use that expression. Okay. Go find a tree and sigh. And and sigh, that's right. <laughs> it, it's really good if you can get yourself what's called the day bed. And you just lie out on it like that. Right? That's, that's the proper way to do it. Okay. Oh, man. <laughs> hey, you must be a, a fan of uh, Charlie Kaufman, Maria. 
He made a he made a movie called Synecdoche in New York, which was very. But he just made a new one. I I I always. Have you seen it? Because it's on Amazon now. Oh no, it's Netflix. Oh, you're Netflix. Yeah, that one I think is probably his best. But what's that? Wait, say that again. Oh, he's from Pope. That's right. This is Alexander Pope. Yes. He, he does weird things. He also did a very strange and disturbing movie called uh, Being John Malkovich. I haven't seen uh, that one or Synecdoche. That's a weird... The, the best one, maybe, Adaptation is good, too. Yeah. I mean, that's good. But anyway, you know, if, if you go online, so nobody's seen it yet, I may watch it. It's one of those things where when you go online, like IMDb, it's either a 10 or a 1, basically. Mm -hmm. People just love this the most. But the other one, I've wasted two, you know, my, I, can't, I can't get these two hours back. Why doesn't anybody watch this crap? It's, just, it's really funny. Cause, so I don't know. But you haven't... Heard any if it's good from anybody uh, who's seen it? Do you know Noah White? Oh, yeah. 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 He, he recently watched it. He, he watched it with his... I taught, I, taught it, I taught him and his wife. Yeah, he yeah. didn't quite get it. He thought it was good, but he didn't quite get it. Okay, so we'll three see. Three and a half out of five, which is too bad. Okay, so I don't know. We'll see. Seven but yeah, it just, came, sorry, it just came to Netflix. I know this. It's called... Say it again. It's, it's, a, it's I'm Waiting for Everything to End. I'm it's Waiting for Everything to End. Um, on Netflix, and I didn't. It didn't even have big names. At least I didn't recognize them. No, it didn't seem to. Yeah, they're, they're kind of new people. No, no, no. I'm thinking of ending things. I'm thinking of ending. I can't remember. I'm thinking of ending things. I, I can't remember because this is a weird title. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they end it all. Uh, I don't recognize any of the names. But like, just for cinematography, this film is very gorgeous. Yeah, they always are. It's, it's, it's strange. So. Uh, again, though, we, we've got that frustrated love, how love sickens, how love stagnates, but there's a, a little bit of hope here. There's almost a weird kind of hope of a kind of resurrection being taken up at the end. So it's, it's in the world of experience. It's uh, un, unrequited desire. But this one has a little bit of hope at the end. Very, very strange. Let's, again, let's just kind of do this quick just for fun because um, I never have time to teach these poems. But we'll do it really quickly. So first, first turn back to page 132. It's Holy Thursday of Innocence. So Songs of Innocence, Holy Thursday. This is another one where we have uh, two poems. Uh, and it's just kind of fun to look at them. Uh, this has a really neat kind of rhythm to it. So it's uh, Holy Thursday of Innocence, 132. T'was on a holy Thursday, their innocent faces clean, the children walking two and two in red and blue and green. Gray-headed beetles walked before with wands as white as snow, Till into the high dome of Paul's, as in St. Paul's, right? They like Thames waters flow. And by the way, if that looks like a weird thing, if you, if you break it up, it's actually the same rhythm as, as Amazing Grace. It's what they call ballad rhythm, right? T'was on a holy Thursday, there is... Oh, no, I just did. Well, that green sleeves is the same thing, actually. As, um, as, uh, or you can also do uh, Old Lang Syne, what they call ballad rhythm. But, so... Um, We've got all of these fresh-faced kids. They're all basically orphans, right? Uh, and they're walking two and two, and it's colorful, and they're protected, and the gray-headed beetles, <laughs> and church officers, okay? I think there's a beetle in, uh, isn't Bumble a beetle yeah. in uh, Oliver Twist? Yeah. Remember, remember his famous line? If the law thinks that, the law is an ass. If the law thinks that, the law is a bachelor. He, because his, his wife has done these things, and, and he's like, I'm getting, I'm getting, my wife did it. And he says, in the law, it is considered that the wife listens to the husband. <laughs> and he says, that's what the law thinks, the law is an ass, and the law is a bachelor. Right? It's really funny. You see Oliver Twist. But the, uh, especially the, uh, have you seen the musical version? Because that's really good. Oh, it won Best Picture of the Year, 67 or something like that, or 68. Really good. 68. It was 68. Um, it's just called Oliver with an exclamation point. One of my old students refused to watch any musical that had an exclamation point at the end of it. What's that? Yeah, I know. He just doesn't like anything with it. Oklahoma has an exclamation point. Zorba. Does uh, Cabaret have an exclamation point? I don't know. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, there we go. We're going to see this pretty soon, that that the romantics use exclamation points in really weird ways. And we'll get to that in a few classes, but they use it in ways you wouldn't expect. Uh, <laughs> of course, if you're a math nerd, what does the exclamation point mean? Factorial, factorial right? Like four factorial means it's like four times, or plus, four plus three plus two plus one. No, I 
Yeah. No, it's multiplied. Or, or is it, it is multiplied. It is multiplied. Okay. Factorial. But I'm not a math person. No. And what is the cool thing that Spanish speakers do with their uh, exclamation point? They have everything. Yeah, they have one at the end, the beginning of Isn't that cool? Time. You ever seen that? You ever learned that? And they do the same thing with the question mark. Yeah, yeah. So you, you have an upside down question mark at the beginning, but, which makes sense so you know how to read it. Yes. You know, if you're That's reading it out loud. Oh, really? does any other language do that? Like, I don't think French does it, right? I don't think any other language. Yeah, it's just the coolest idea. So let's do a search. Does anybody else? Do you... It makes sense. Yeah. Do you have any idea how hard it is to figure out how to do this on like a laptop? Oh, that's oh yeah, that's right. Very, very difficult. We should know they'd be on a laptop. I guess it would be on there. That's right. If it was. <laughs> so anyway, I just I love so here the Beatles are they're, they're they're the people that work for the church, but they're good. Like they're actually trying to help the children, right? Uh, with wands as white as snow, like they're, they're Gandalf or something, and they're kindly old men helping the children. And I love what what are they comparing the children to as they flow into the church? It's the Thames, right? They're, they're, they're the river that runs through London. What's that? Yeah. Oh, you're right. It's pretty dirty. Yeah, better than it used to be in the Victorian age. For a while, it was so despicable. You covered your nose as you walked by it. <laughs> they, they are. I mean, you know, again, they, I mean, basically, they are paying attention to the you know people that have been overlooked in a way. They're they're looking at the people that are close and all that, and they're they're giving us a different voice. Uh, and, and, and it is different. It's the things that we overlook and we don't notice. Uh, and some of that is political, like the French Revolution. Others of it is more artistic and aesthetic. Let's hear from them. I mean, you've got a little bit like, uh, what is it, Tom Jones, some of the novels, that The Orphan, The Rags to Riches. But, but still, they're set in a world where everybody else is rich. You know? And they're, they turn out to be blue-blooded anyway, just like Oliver Twist. Uh, again, just to see the difference. Oh, what a multitude they seem, these flowers of London town. All so natural, so moving. This is, uh, again, it, it's a world that's got orphans, but it's a world where they're being cared for. Here, seated in companies, they sit with radiance all their own. The hum of multitudes was there, but multitude of lambs, thousands of little boys and girls raising their innocent hands. Now, again, remember we said in the lamb, in, in innocence, what aspect of Jesus is captured in the lamb? But it's the child, the spotless lamb of God. This is not the lamb for the slaughter, as it would be in the world of experience. So here again, innocence. Now like a mighty wind, they raise to heaven the voice of song, or like harmonious thunderings, the seats of heaven among. This beautiful choir calling out to God, all of this wonderful thing. You know, this is, uh, you know, this, this is the show they put on. Everybody look nice, you know, when they come in. Beneath them sit the aged men, wise guardians of the poor. They're not going to be that in the world of experience. Then cherish pity lest you drive an angel from your door. Does uh, Blake have a verse from Hebrews in mind? It's in the footnote, so yes. Oh, it is down there. Okay, you say you know that one. Right? But it's, it's one of my favorites, right? Always show hospitality because by so doing, some have entertained angels. Everywhere. And you all know uh, Hannah, Hannah... A lot of Hannah's. What's the last name? Ah, who, who was the famous swimmer? The swimmer that won all the awards. Who's not Phelps? No, thank you, Phelps. That's her last. She's not related, but I just yeah, yeah. I got a mental block. Yeah. Hannah Phelps, yeah, they're not they're not related. Uh, but Hannah Phelps, uh, really nice, made made a little cross stitch of, of Hebrews thirteen. I've got in my my house, like, hospitality, um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, again, this this in, in a world of innocence. The state and church guard you, guard your innocence. Now look at how different the one of experience is. Ooh, it's very scary. It's on page, uh, second. Uh, here it is, page 137. Right under the clot. Of, how different this is. Is this a holy thing to see in a rich and fruitful land? Babes reduced to misery, fed with cold and usurious hands. You know what the word usurious means? It comes from the word usury. You know what that means? This used to be considered a major sin throughout the entire Middle Ages. 
and is still considered a sin in, 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 in uh, or Orthodox Islam. They're not dirty. Usury? Have you ever heard of usury? Again, exactly. That, that would be an excellent thing. Usury means selling, lending out money at high rates of interest. Right? And, and really, that's what a pawnbroker is doing, too, ultimately. Right? But you're right, that, that would be a perfect example of that. And certainly, that's what God had in mind, right? But, now, but people, throughout the Middle Ages, they considered any kind of lending at interest was a sin. And it was also a sin for the Muslims. And that's one of the reasons why Jews became bankers in the Middle Ages, because they were the only ones that could do it. And it's kind of funny, because, and really, if you look at it carefully, God did forbid usury to the Jews, but only to other Jews. Um, so they could do it to Gentiles. Uh, and again, people say, but I mean, that is now the entire foundation of our, of our like, modern democracy and modern capitalism is that. Uh, but if you talk to people like in places like Saudi Arabia, they still are against usury. So how do they have banks? What they do is if you go to one of those banks and you want to borrow $100, they give you like 85 and then you pay them back. It's like a way of getting around usury because you can't have a banking system. I mean, how can you do it? Um, but people don't understand how much of the Middle Ages was, was you know, kind of that, that. And again, it was considered a very bad. I mean, for Dante, it's a very bad sin. Uh, the usurers, okay, you might remember that there are three people that are punished in the burning sand. If you know Dante's Inferno, they are the blasphemers, and they're the ones who are prostrate on the burning sand. There are the sodomites, the homosexuals, the sodomites, who are walking around. And then the usurers are crouched, and they're weeping into their money bags. But that's considered a real, that, that's level uh, seven. So that's pretty low down, uh, much worse than all the people up in the upper hell. Um, so that, that's it. these people, these, these sort of bankers, but just, just in general, people that are, really, it would actually be closer to what you just said, uh, Bill, the, the people that are using the, the poor. And, uh, you know, that, like people would call the, the lottery attacks on the poor, because <laughs> they're the ones that buy most of the lottery tickets. Right? Oh, the, the, this is about 1783. You know, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about it, but that's right. That was one of their major, like, one of the major things John Wesley sought to change in their culture was injury. That is a good point. He did that. I forgot about you. And you know what? You know what else they did in England? It was insane. Now, I'd be really impressed. Have you read Little Dorrit? Yeah. Wow, you read that. That's, that's a, a very long uh, Dickens novel. And that's almost a repetition. But I told you, remember, I found you the short Dickens novel when we were going to read Hard Times. But it's still just as good. Very bored. You're very bored. And they, they've made some good movies and miniseries. But anyway, uh, Little Door exposes what they... Have you ever heard about uh, the, the pauper's prison? Like if you were in debt or a debtor's prison. You were put in prison until you could pay off your debt. But how can you pay off your debt if you're in prison? It was kind of insanity. And I, I think Matt Wesley might have talked about that too. Uh, but, but again, that, that and of course... What character in Dickens is the is the embodiment of usury? Scrooge, okay, he is the usurer, you know, and, and, and doing that, and, and of course he's miserable too, you know. It's it's you know you, you you watch him and go home and you know eat his gruel, and he's like, man, what do the poor people eat if this is what Scrooge is eating? But anyway, you don't spend any money, right? Um, the uh, but, but again, it's a very different world here, right? Here we are in a rich and fruitful land, and yet look at this squalid poverty used by people that are grasping. Is that trembling cry a song? Can it be a song of joy? And so many children poor, it is a land of poverty. Now suddenly what, in the beginning, that cry that was like a, an angel's choir, right? Now, what is that? It's, it's, like, it's like a screech. What is it, right? How, how is this possible? Uh, can there be, can that be joy? And their sun does never shine, and their fields are bleak and bare, and their ways are filled with thorns. It is eternal winter there. And again, I mean, the, the, you know, the workhouse, and that's exposed in, in Oliver Twist, but even more in David Copperfield, uh, the first part of David Copperfield, uh, very much. A lot, a lot of what, uh, what Dickens wrote is a cry against this sort of thing. Um, For where'er the sun does shine, and where'er the rain does fall, babe can never hunger there, nor poverty the mind appall. Now, of course, that, that's a hope at the end that doesn't exist. It, it, it's, it's what it should be like, but isn't. The soul of the nation is perishing. It's a weird way to put it. Nor poverty the mind appall. 
What, what can poverty do to the mind? Not the body now, but to the mind. Good, good. It, it, it just, it, it, it appalls and it, it makes you dark. You know, there, there was this, this very scary old movie called, uh, was it called The Black Cat or The Raven? It had nothing to do with Edgar Allan Poe, but it was uh, an evil Boris Karloff who, who's like a plastic surgeon and somebody comes to him to get a, a new face, you know, and so he does something to make his face look ugly because ugly people do ugly things and then he uses them as his killer hunter. It's really big old. It's moving from like 1932. It's really scary. Um, anyway, it's pretty cool. Um, but you know, again, what, what it does, the inside becomes corrupt, right? The, the, the in, the, see, I mean, he's, he's for where are the sun to shine and where are the rain to fall in that pastoral world of innocence, then, then it would be impossible for a child to hunger on the outside or be twisted on the inside, but not in the world of experience. Wow. Just really quickly, a few more. This is, this is fun. I said I never have time to do this, and I'll still leave myself time for one more thing. Uh, if, if you go back to Innocence and the Divine Image on page 131, just, just, just a quick beginning to this. Uh, page 131, the Divine Image, it says, To mercy, pity, peace, and love, all pray in their distress, and to these virtues of delight return their thankfulness. So here is, you know, these sort of virtues, mercy, pity, peace, love, all of them are simple. Uh, they, 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 they cause thankfulness. They have mercy, mercy, pity, peace, and love as God our Father dear. Mercy, pity, peace, and love as man, his child, and care. We're all together. This is, this is a place of, of, of uh, joy and charity and whatnot. But now watch. What happens in the contrary on page 142? It's called the human abstract. On page 142, and this is this is pretty strong language here, and in a way kind of convicting. He says, "Pity would be no more if we did not make somebody poor." <laughs> hey, mercy no more could be if all were as happy as we. Now, of course. The innocent version of this, what does is, what is Tiny Tim tell his father? This is one of the most Christian moments in there, that he likes to go to church and let people see him. Why? Do we know? I wonder if you really know that book well. Christmas Carol. What do you say? I hope that when people look at me in church, they'll be reminded of the one who makes the lame walk. Remember that? It's a really beautiful moment in this. It doesn't always uh, mention in the movie versions so many of them. Uh, but that's what Tiny Tim says. I mean, that, there's the ultimate example of innocence is, is Tiny Tim who's preserved that. Right? Uh, but here, uh, again, it's almost like, you know, well, I, I was saying before as people were walking in that G.K. Chesterton said the definition of a humanitarian is someone who loves humanity but hates human beings. You know, it's that kind of a cold and usurious hand that, that they, they almost want to make people. Well, first of all, there is a uh, uh, what, what would you call it? A, 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 a disease, a mental disease. How many of you saw the movie uh, The Sixth Sense? Do you remember where the boy helps expose a mother who has this, whatever this disease is called? What, what does she do? You do what to your children? Yeah, you poison them and make them sick so that you can care for them. Right? I don't know if what the name is, but apparently that is a. Uh, you heard of it? Is there a word for it? Munchausen. Oh, yes, that is. Now I, I thought I heard it before. Yeah, it is an actual uh, complex or whatever word you want to call it. Terrifying, right? You have... Oh, that's right. The Phantom is sort of like that. Yeah. I, I know you like that. I like that movie. Yeah, that, that was very good. It's a weird one. Did he say it was going to be his last movie or something? He did. He said that many times. He said that many times, yeah. I'll get it back. It's like, it's like Miyazaki. This is my last cartoon. He makes another one, another one, another one. Is he 80, 80 or something? I don't know. But, um, but again, that, that's sort of convicting. Let, let's not do that, right? Uh, to, to make them poor so that we can help them. Sort of a weird thing. And mutual fear brings peace <laughs> till the selfish loves increase. Then cruelty knits a snare and spreads his baits with care. Now we're getting into uh, the, 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 the nature of sin, the sickening that reaches out. He sits down with holy fears and waters the ground with tears. Then humility takes its root underneath his foot, soon spreads the dismal shade of mystery over his head. 
and the caterpillar and fly feed on the mystery. This is, this is Blake getting cryptic again. It's his way of attacking priesthood and priestcraft and, and spins their webs and stuff like that. You sit there in your chair and spin your little webs. If you got that, I'd be impressed. Somebody's talking to Mr. Potter. That's what George Bailey says to Mr. Potter, and it's a wonderful life. You know what I mean? You sit there like a spider. Spin your webs. Yeah. How many, come on, how many times have you seen It's a Wonderful Life? You haven't seen it? We've never seen it. Never seen it! You know what? What? You could, like, you could, like, lose your status as a homeschool example. Yeah. Blame our parents, I guess. Oh, man, okay. As a Christmas, well, yeah, it was a little Christmas story that somebody put, yeah, just a little Christmas, the idea of it. It's a Wonderful Life. You can see the, you can see the modern version of It's a Wonderful Life, uh, Groundhog Day, which is one of my favorite movies. <laughs> it's really a good movie. Kind of a mixture of that and 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 and, and, and Christmas Hill, really. Um, he says, and it bears the fruit of deceit, ruddy and sweet to eat, and the raven his nest has made, and its thickest shade. Again, he's trying to get how how it grows, how this said. Look how it ends. The gods of the earth and sea sought through nature to find this tree, but their search was all in vain. There grows one in the human brain. We're back to the mind forged manacles, the way everything can get. Twist. Let, let's end with this really disturbing poem. And like I said, anybody can fall into this. Look at, look at the poison, a poison tree, 144. I was angry with my friend. I told my wrath. My wrath did end. I was angry with my foe. I told it not. My wrath did grow. Remember that. Okay. Maybe there's something, I mean, maybe there's something to be said for confession. Have you ever done Orthodox confession? Really? Because yeah. they do it too. I mean, it's less known, but they do it. Uh, but that's, you know, that's kind of a weird thing for people, but there's something to be said for confessing and letting it go, right? And when you hold on to it, all of it, again, Blake, again, you know, Blake gets crazier and crazier, but he does understand human psychology and how when you hold on to an anger, it just festers. And it's terrifying what, what you get. That's what he gets at. And look, at just remember this if you want to allow the anger to fester, what could happen? So it says, so he said, I, I didn't tell my wrath and it grew. And he said, and I watered it in fear. He says, literally, we still use that word, nursing a grudge. And I watered it in fears, night and morning with my tears. And I sunned it with smiles and with soft, deceitful wiles. This evil, perverse growth that he's, that he's you know, nurturing with his hatred. And it grew both day and night till it bore an apple bright. And my foe beheld it shine. And he knew that it was mine. And into my garden stole, when the night had veiled the pole, in the morning glad I see my foe outstretched beneath the tree. Oh, it's like he's eaten that poison apple and it's killed him. Terrifying, okay? This is what we do, though. We, we need to be careful when we nurse the grudge and nurse the grudge and pour into it. And, and uh, we end up like... One of the great psychological moments is in Snow White and the Seven Dwarves when she takes the apple and she turns herself into a hag and she comes out and says, then I will be the fairest. Huh. And when we see her come out of her lair, it looks like she's coming out of a coffin. I only call that movie one. Oh, you're telling That was the first thing that terrified. I think, I think my daughter's first full sentence was something like, evil witch coming. You know, it's like, the, you know, the... <laughs> The, the fear, that, that, that just that fear like made her say like a full sentence. So I can't remember exactly what it was, but it had something to do with the witch. It really is terrifying. I was scared she was illiteracy. Yeah, she, she, she was terrified of illiteracy. That's great. That's what it was, though. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I, my son, too. There used to be somebody at my church a long time ago named Dan. Dan the man. He was huge. He was a big guy with a giant beard and stuff like that. And he saw him. He's like, Dan, driving bus. That, that was like his first full sentence, too, the fear. You know, they say the fear of the Lord is the beauty of the wisdom. The fear of this guy is the beauty of all wisdom. You know, it's like, oh, man. Okay, let, let, let's get started. Like I said, uh, um, I, I mentioned before quickly that, that um, even though we should say that romanticism begins with, uh, with songs of and experience, because it was so expensive to buy, almost nobody knew about it. But Lyrical Ballast was published cheaply. Now, Next week, we'll start talking about, next Tuesday, we'll talk about Wordsworth's actual preface, what he was doing. But I thought better to keep jumping in and look at uh, one poem today, and we'll look at a few more poems on uh, next class. Some of the poems from Lyrical Ballads 
and see what Wordsworth is doing. And he's got very simple subject matter, but he's got deep meaning underneath. So this, this is a, a wonderful book. It's called We Are Seven. And let me give you the page here. Uh, page 288. Again, if you type in Wordsworth, We Are Seven, you can probably find it. We Are Seven. I, get the, I really I, liked it. I, it's yeah, but part of that for me was um, Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. Uh, and so I thought that in that context. I feel like meeting, 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 meeting a little Abby or something like that. It's good stuff. It's a really neat poem. And what's absolutely unique about this poem is this is the only poem where Wordsworth, who is the speaker. You know, I mean, you know, you always want to be careful to say the speaker rather than the poet. But when you start moving into romantic poetry, it almost always is the poet. I mean, this is something they're doing. Um, but anyway, this is the only case where the speaker is Wordsworth, and he's basically taking the 18th century point of view. In other words, the Enlightenment age of reason point of view, because he's over against this little girl. Compared to the little girl, he becomes the 18th century guy. But in other poems, especially when we get to expostulation and reply on Thursday, he, he will be taking the romantic point of view in there. But let, let's look at this poem, page 288. Usually I let you guys read, but nobody's going to be able to hear. That, can anybody read loud enough? Maybe. Can you read it loud? I can read it loud. Okay, try it right, just so, so it picks up over here. We are hearing from Maria Cook. Go ahead. We are seven. A simple child that lightly draws its breath and feels its life in every limb. What should it know of death? I met a little cottage girl. She was eight years old, she said. Her hair was thick with many a curl clustered round her head. She had a rustic woodland air, and she was wildly clad. Her eyes were fair and very fair. Her beauty made me glad. Sisters and brothers, little maid, how many may you be? How many? Seven in all, she said, and wandering looked at me. And where are they, I pray you tell? She answered, Seven are we, and two of us at Conway dwell, and two are gone to sea. Two of us in the churchyard lie, my sister and my brother, and in the churchyard cottage I dwell near them with my mother. You say that two at Conway dwell, and two are gone to sea, yet ye are seven, I pray you tell, sweet maid, how this may be. Then did the little maid reply, Seven boys and girls are we. Two of us in the churchyard lie beneath the churchyard tree. You run about, my little maid, your limbs, they are alive. If two are in the churchyard laid, then ye are only five. Their graves are green, they may be seen, the little maid replied. Twelve steps or more from my mother's door, and they are side by side. My stockings there I often knit, my kerchief there I hang, and there upon the ground I sit and sing a song to them. And often after sunset, sir, when it is light and fair, I take my little porringer and eat my supper there. The first that died was Sister Jane, in bed she moaning lay, so God released her of her pain, and then she went away. So in the churchyard she was laid, and when the grass was dry, together round her grave we played, my brother John and I. And when the ground was white with snow, and I could run and slide, my brother John was forced to go, and he lies by her side. How many are you then, said I, if they too are in heaven? Quick was the little maid to reply, Oh, master, we are seven. But they are dead, those two are dead, their spirits are in heaven was throwing words away for still the little maid would have her will and said may we are seven good job thank you very good very good it's a beautiful poem but again it, it, it's 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 a dichotomy between the sort of adult perception of the world and perception of life and death and the little girl's perception of light and death and in this poem basically the little girl is representing the new romantic ethos and the man wordsworth is representing the 18th century rational view, right? And it's about their view of life and death. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll ask Maria, uh, the little girl here, 
would she be more likely to be a uh, Orthodox or a Protestant? Um, I think Orthodox. Yeah. Okay. Why? This is this is something cool, and she's Orthodox. So I'm asking her. One of the neat things in, in Greek Orthodox Church is that uh, it's called the Divine Liturgy. The, the Catholics call it the Mass. They call it the Divine Liturgy. And when the Divine Liturgy is being performed in your church, where else is it being performed? Yeah, the heaven, the throne room of heaven, right? And again, here's the weird thing, okay? If you're a Christian, whatever kind of Christian you are, then we should believe that our, the, the, you know, the, the saints that have died in the faith, our, our dead relatives, are alive, and in fact, ultimately more alive than we are. But particularly if you're Protestant, we tend to act like they're gone. Okay, now, again, I, you can make a biblical debate as to whether or not the people in heaven can see what's going on here, whether they're in contact. I mean, I think you could argue either way. Um, but what what aspect of both Catholicism and Orthodoxy that seems pretty strange uh, for Protestants shows that Catholic and Orthodox see the saints as still very much alive and part of what we call the community of saints? Uh, what's, what's the phrase? Um, yeah, communion, uh, commun communion of saints, which is part of the part of the creed, isn't it? Okay. The communion of saints. What what do they do in the Orthodox Catholic Church? Okay, the Eucharist. But there's something else that shows that they consider the the dead people to be part of the congregation. Yeah, per, prayers to saints. Okay, that that seems really weird to Protestants, okay? especially if you're a low Protestant like a Baptist. Um, what are you what are you praying to this, this saint? Okay, but the idea is that they're closer to God, right? And and that they're still. An active part. And so if I'm trying to explain to a fellow Protestant how they can do this, what's weird about it, what I would say, and just think about this, right? If you're, if you're a Christian, and let's say I'm going through a real difficult struggle in my life. If I were to ask seven of my Christian friends and family to pray for me, would their prayers get me more quickly through that time period? They probably would, if they're all praying for me. Well, what about asking people to pray for you up there? I mean, ultimately, that it's 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 we, we do. Like I said, if you're obviously Protestants, we believe they're they're alive, but it's somehow like they're cut off, they're gone, right? Uh, and uh, again, I, I don't know whether they can see what's going, whether they're interested in what's going on, whatever, whether they can intercede. I don't know. Um, but beyond the whole idea of Christianity, it's, it's got nothing to do with salvation. It's got to do with that border between life and death. Are, for, from this point, the girl's point of view, her dead children, her dead brothers and sisters are what? They're alive, right? They're still part of the family, an active part of the family. Now, uh, do any of you have like a like a grandma or a grandpa that actually goes to the cemetery? Less and less people do that, but some do. I, I don't know if anybody, even my generation or your generation, you, you think you, you'll do that? No, I do. Oh, you actually do. You actually do. Okay, like I said, that's kind of a rare thing. And go and you know the, the talk to. Of course, I wonder when they cremate people if people will do that anymore. Of course, some people actually have ashes on their fireplace. <laughs> you know, I, I thought that was a little bit weird. Um, but again, that idea was much more popular in the past. You would see people going to the tombstone, and of course, they would often put fresh flowers. But but sometimes they would talk out loud, like talking to, them, especially if like the husband and wife, that where one died. Uh, but it, again, that's that's just. That, that in itself, itself is more romantic, right? In, in the sense that it still sees continuity. It's not so cut and dry. He, he, the man is being absolutely logical. He's saying, this kid's nuts. I mean, what are you talking about? Look, you, you just told me they're dead. They're dead. What are you on? But they, and look at how she sees them as part of her family. It's so beautiful. She says, um, line, uh, line 45, um, often after sunset, well, well, no, earlier than that, uh, 41, my stockings there I often knit, my kerchief there I have. She sits there and sings a song to them. They're still part of her family, very much. Right? Uh, she'll take a little, you know, pour it, like, like who, who eats her curds and whey? Little Miss Muffet. That's what she's eating, her curds and whey, right? Little, little Miss Muffet sat on the tuffet and eat her curds and whey. Um, and eat my supper there. And then, look how she describes it. The first that died was Sister Jane, in bed she moaning lay, till God released her of her pain. And then she went away. There's a more uh, natural view of death. She just was taken away. Right? Now, the next one, though, is a little bit more 
violent, or at least a little more uh, physical. It says, um, and when the ground was white with snow and I could run and slide, my brother John was forced to go, and he lies by her side. So forced to, it's getting a little more forced, but still it's, it's part of her world. It's, it's part of her life. And there isn't this absolute barrier, barrier between one world and the other. They're still there. They talk. Are you in communion with them? Any of your, any, are you in communion with any of your dead grandmas? Are they, are they all alive? Okay. And then just, you know, this kind of, I don't know, like I said, it's just a different, uh, a different ethos, uh, a different way of looking at life. And that's why I always said, I think Americans would be more healthy if we started, if we started to celebrate what famous Mexican holiday. Yeah, Dia de Muertos, Day of the Dead, Coco, right? I mean, I, I think I think it would be good because I think we're too terrified by death. I don't know. Does, that, does anybody would anybody have a desire to eat a candy skull? What do you think? Don't they make the little skulls out of candy? In a Spanish class, we were given like the like lollipops. Oh yeah! Oh, they look like a. <laughs> that's cool stuff. I ate that, so I guess. Oh, maybe, I mean, but I mean, like, again, sometimes we, we're just too terrified. We we need to. You know, it, it is part of life. I mean, have to be careful. I mean, when we become pagans in that sense. But uh, anyway, it's just a great thing. And it's just beautiful. Cool, cool. Okay, a um, couple more things. We'll go. Uh, just, like I said, I'm not talking as much about form as I sometimes do, but it's really neat, okay? The rhyme scheme here is what we call A-B-A-B, right? So something like girl said curl head. There is one. There's actually only two stanzas that break that format of A-B-A-B. Can you find them? Good, because the last one's very, it's got five lines. And which one before that? There's one more before that. And then we'll, we'll look at them in order. Good, good, very good. It's the one that's uh, line uh, 37, 36, 37. Their graves are green, they may be seen. Now, that's A, B, C, B, but not exactly, because it's got what we call internal rhyme, right? Their graves are green, they may be seen. Twelve steps or more from my mother's door. And what I love about what he's done there. Right? So those are the only two lines where, you know, except for the last stanza, where the, the last word doesn't rhyme, but, but it does. And what it does is it puts a heavy emphasis on those words, green and more. How do those two words sum up the little girl's perception of the world? Green and more. Yeah, there's more. And green you know, connotes life, moving on. It's green, it's more. I mean, it's just those, those words and the sound of those words, right? And because of the green and more, the door hasn't closed in her face. She can still see it. I mean, it's, those four words are almost like the poem in some way, particularly from the girl's point of view. Really wonderful. And then he just gives up. He keeps thinking. It's, it's really funny how, you know, the, the adult trying to use logic, and they keep just saying, they're not going to get it. You know, they, they just keep trying. And it's, it's, I don't know, it's just, and, and it's so funny, the, the parents, I remember once, do you remember when the Miller Outdoor, the, the Herman Park used to have a big train? It was a, I don't, I don't mean the little train, I mean a, a huge engine, like from the 19th century was there. And I think they finally fixed it up and took it away or something, it's not there anymore. But one time I remember I took my kids there and I saw this father who was clearly an engineer walking his little girl and the little girl goes, what's that daddy? And he says, Looks like a train from the latter half of the 19th century. This always stuck in my mind. What is this little girl? The latter half of the 19th century. I anyway, just always stuck in my mind. It's wonderful. The girl's probably a little little nerd now. But anyway, okay. And then quickly look at the look at the last tenza. It's really weird. The rhyme scheme is actually A B C C B, right? So it's it's really weird. And, and you see that in, in other medieval ballads. He hasn't made that up. It's weird, but. What's really cool is that uh, what word, what line then gets cut off from the poem? From, good, death. that first line about death. But they are dead, those two are dead. It just sort of gets cut off in its own limbo. And, and, and that's, that's the world of the adult, but it's not, it hasn't infected the world of the girl, right? And what's really neat is, in one sense you can say the word dead is the only last word that doesn't rhyme with anything. Well, actually it does rhyme with something. What does it rhyme with? Itself. So death has no echo. It rhymes only with itself. So I just think that's a really clever thing uh, that Wordsworth is doing there. Uh, there, there, there is, it's an internal rhyme, but it really isn't. It's just the same word. It, it rings hollow, quite literally. 
And the girl wins. She holds on to it and he gives up. I can't, I can't convince her. She thinks this is good. It's like saying, I, I can't stop my daughter from you know, uh, majoring in English and wanting to teach. Right, Maria? You've won them over, though? So, okay. They're stuck with it now. They're stuck with it now. Okay, good. We'll, we'll find you a good classical Christian school. You'll love it. It's good stuff. So. All right. Good job, folks. Next class, we will do those other three poems uh, um, that are from the Lyrical Ballads. So, not too much reading. You may want to start reading Frankenstein if you haven't read it before, because uh, that's like the longest thing. Oh, you still can't find that book? I mean, again, it's, it's kind of, you know, it'll be harder because the page numbers, it's harder to find. But yeah, I haven't been able to find that exact copy either. Oh, it, it, it wasn't in our book, or did it get sold out? It was sold out. Oh, wow. Okay. Did you, did you follow the, 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 the thing I gave you, the, the ISBN number? Yeah, I still couldn't find it. Still couldn't find it? Uh-huh. Oh. Oh, well, that's right for the book, because the, the, all three parts of those books will be going through. That's right. But the, I mean, if you absolutely can't find it, we'll just get by, just get, get a, I mean, you can find a copy anywhere. Of that. You have, in fact, that's free online, too, obviously, if you want to read a whole novel online. It'll be a little harder, uh, um, you know, the page numbers may be different when you're doing your essay, but I'll, I'll take that into account and, and do it. And we'll try, it's just hard, because it's hard to find the page numbers when we go through it, but I'll, I'll, I'll go it out loud. But, but if you do find it, use, use the 1818, the older edition, and we'll figure it out. It might have just gone out of, a, out of print or something, maybe, as I was putting this together. I don't know. So. 